welcome friends. We're so thrilled to have you tonight. Um, thank you for joining me for this, the latest lecture presented by the Speed Art Museum as part of the Alfred R. Shands III and Mary N. Shands Master Series. My name is Kim Spence and I'm the Director of Collections and Exhibitions at the museum. And joining me tonight is artist and philosopher, Noel W. Anderson, whose work you will recognize from our recent exhibition, Promise, Witness, Remembrance. In tonight's lecture, Beyond This Point, Abstraction is Promise, Anderson will discuss the function of black publications, weaving, representation, and abstraction in his arts-based research. Beginning with his erased Ebony Magazine works included in Promise Witness Remembrance, Anderson will talk about how he seeks to confront the limited representations of Black identity. Think of Black subjectives as always already abstract, and consequently explore the possibilities of abstraction as a mode of critique. Anderson utilizes print media and arts-based research to explore philosophical inquiry methodologies. He primarily focuses on the mediation of socially constructed images of identity formation as it relates to Black masculinity and celebrity. Born in Louisville in 1981, Noel holds two MFAs, one from Indiana University in printmaking and another from Yale University in sculpture. He currently serves as area head of printmaking at NYU Steinhardt Department of Art and Arts Professions. In 2018, Noel was awarded the NYFA Artist Fellowship Grant and the prestigious Jerome Prize. His solo exhibition, Black Origin Moment, debuted at the Contemporary Arts Center Cincinnati in February 2017 and traveled to the Hunter Museum of American Art in October 2019. His first monograph, Black Origin Moment, was also recently published. Following Noel's presentation, there's an opportunity for him to answer any of your questions. So I wanna encourage everyone to use the Q&A window to type in your questions or comments as we go along. Um, we'll have time for that after the, the conclusion of his lecture. Noel, welcome. And thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us tonight about your work. I'm really excited and looking forward to this. Cool, cool, cool. Actually, can I, can I ask a question? Sure. Can you hear those sirens in the background at all? Could you hear them? Okay. Perfect, because if you could hear him, I, I, I might have I closed I might have closed the door, but you know, shit, if you, you can't hear him, let's get it. Okay, cool. Actually, you know what? Let me close the windows because this is distracting the hell out of me. Give me one second, okay? Of course. As uh, as Noel was saying before we started, he said, This is the joy of living in New York City, that you get the energy of the city surrounding you. So um, thank you for your patience and uh, this is gonna be great. I'm so glad he could join us tonight. That's so perfect. See, look at that. Now I, I, have, I, have, I have no sirens. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Yes. Okay, so I wanted to, well, first of all, thank you for, uh, for inviting me, <laughs> uh, you know. Uh, thank you for inviting me um, to participate in, in another, elect, in, in this lecture series. I, you know, I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, born and raised. Uh, I never thought I'd have an opportunity to to go into the museum and now I'm, I'm, I have not only been in the museum as a teenager, but I also ha was lucky enough, blessed enough to be included in in the brilliant show, uh, Brianna's show, that Allison Glenn, you know, luckily tapped me for. Um, and we'll talk about that, I hope, because I think that has a lot to do with abstraction as promise, death as promise, death as abstraction. Ooh, that's a thing. But I wanted to try something first. Uh, so I wrote this essay for a uh, burn way uh, that talked about my experience of, you know, growing up in Louisville and experiencing the speed. And I wanted to just give you a little sense of what it was like for me to, as a, as a high school, uh, uh, what was I, 16, uh, 16 year old black kid from Louisville, Kentucky, who was also an athlete sneaking into the museum. Cause I used to park across the street at, at, at this, uh, frat house that I thought was free until I got a ticket. But you know that, you know, you learn, you learn. This is whatever, you learn. Uh, and I, I would go in and I would experience this particular moment that I'm gonna try to give you by way of the screen. So there's gonna be a little music. We're gonna look at some images and then I'm gonna cut the images, stop the music, and then we're gonna start the show, okay? So let's see, I should share screen. Yes, look at you, doing well. Can you see that, Kim? Can you see my screen? 
Perfect, 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 perfect. Yes, I can't see your screen. Thanks. Perfect. So let's go in, shall we? This is what it was like when I was uh, a high school student walking through the museum, and there was a particular album, Outcast the Quim and I just broke me. Broke me, right? All Outcast broke me, but at this point, I it, it, it opened a whole nother world. These two moments collapsed or entangled, uh, as Barad would say, created. Perfect. Yes. Good, 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 good. Kim, did that work? Can you can you come on and let's say yes, that worked. I don't know. Yes, that worked. That was perfect. Got us all um, ready for tonight. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm just going to go and hopefully we can catch up. All right. So those three paintings, right? I remember walking into the speed and staring at those religiously. One, I would see them all the time because they never really, you know, rotated the the the, the main collection, the permanent collection, which was good for me because I could always come back and and notice subtle things like uh, this underdrawing on the, the 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 bottom left of the painting and trying to figure out what to do with that, which we might see later on in work that I'm making now, right? I would see the kind of foppishness of a dandy that I thought, oh, well, this looks like a white pimp. Shout out to my man store. Or I would see this Rembrandt. I would I would always stop at this one because um, it was kind of at the end of the journey at the top floor. It held its own space. It held its own wall, and it and it fucking glowed, man. It it glowed. It was. It looked like it was plugged into the wall. I had never seen anything like it. But at the same time. I never saw anything like myself in those museums either. It was almost as if I was erased. It was almost as if I wasn't even a part of the equation. And you know, you know, the, the colonizers are really good at mathematics. If I wasn't a part of this equation. And we'll get back to this. So I started making these works, these erased ebony works uh, when I was in grad school at, uh, at Yale in sculpture and I would buy um, I would buy tons and tons of ebony magazines off of eBay because I'd be up at like two, three in the morning trying to hustle and keep up with the Joneses, all the brilliant artists that I went to school with. Um, and then one time, one day I, I figured, you know, um, what can I do at this moment with the materials I have? Because, you know, I'm broke now and I spent all my money on these ebony magazines. And I kind of figured out how to erase them. But as I was working on this kind of, this idea of erasure, but not even realizing what erasure meant, and we'll get to that, I was walking the Met, right? I was walk walking the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I was finding other things that were excluded from the main view. And when, in this instance, I mean excluded, not that it wasn't in the institution, right? These tapestries, this one particular is not, it, I'm sorry. These tapestries that I found in the in museum are included in the institution. But in terms of the kind of population or the numbers that, that actually go and stare and study these things, it didn't seem comparable to say like a Monet, you know, or a Degas or a Rauschenberg, my God, the genius. 
So I decided this is what I need, where's where I needed to be at the edge. Plus nobody was making weavings. Nobody I knew cared about weaving. And I was like, well, that's what I have to do. Right. And after doing the research and finding out that 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 weaving, you know, politically and socially, historically was such a, a, a significant art form. Right. Even today uh, uh, in Paris, you have the Goblins manufacturer that is the state run uh, uh, tapestry uh, institute. Right. We don't have that. They have that. Right. That kind of history was interesting to me. Right. And in this way, it was also kind of interesting, at least in this image, which is a print, and I throw it in there for my print printmakers in the, in the audience. I, I'm really interested in the intersection between printing, painting, uh, photography, tapestry, and sculpture. So then I started making these tapestries. They were easy. They were just, you know, easy in the sense that the image was very identifiable. You know, if it was like a man holding a baby uh, or two lovers kissing, you could tell what it was. There was no, there was nothing to it, right? I had this image. I put it in a digital software. I sent it to some weavers, the weaving guild that I work with. They, they would weave it. They send it back. I didn't do much to it. That got boring really, really fast. Along came my, my love of this man. David Hammonds, he broke me. He broke me in a few ways. He broke me in a sense that he, he redirected my understanding of what art could be. Cigarettes and some clothes hangers, what we talking about? He redirected my emphasis and understanding of, of, of the power of uh, denial, you know, rejecting the viewer's gaze, pulling back a little bit, something like that. The tease. So I decided to make a tapestry using his image. So I made a tapestry that was this image. It was about, uh, let's see, overall 96 inches by 102 inches. But a, a problem happened. I overworked it. I wanted to still maintain the structure or the, the, the legibility really of this image, but I went ham. You know, I went, I went ham. Like, like Porky was like, bro, what you doing? What you doing over here? 21 Savage, 21 Savage, 21, 21. And I was upset with myself because when I went ham, I put foam, acrylic, man. I was, I had a, I had a studio in Cincinnati, a huge factory. I would go into the basement and pull everything out of that place and throw it at this tapestry and see what's stuck, right? Glass slides, wire, you know, channeling, you know, trying to reiterate a, a kind of Hamzian move while also superimposing the beginning of what I think is like a, um, a Gilliam staining, right? But I totally lost the image and I lost the image here too. And what happened with me in these images, and I remember asking myself literally, because I was the only one in the studio in Cincinnati losing my mind. I remember standing there saying, what happens when that, what happened to you when that black body fell into abstraction? By which I mean, what happens when the black body becomes illegible? We go, we, let's go there. The black body becomes illegible damn near every day. We're at the edge of vision. Man, shit. That's why I went to the tapestry because the tapestry is at the edge of vision. So then, ooh, then I made these images and I enjoyed the way they responded to gravity. They became bodies, they became weighted. They became prisoners, they became subjects. Became representations of a black body in its own right. I'm also thinking about Soutine and the way Soutine paints a slab of beef. I mean, you can't tell me we don't see that. So then, I was given this opportunity to have an exhibition um, at the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati. Oh, we're good on time. Uh, Black origin moment, which a lot of people heard me talk about, but I'd like to at least drop it here so I can we can move to the next the, the, the next iteration. Let's go there. You know, I, I had this question, this prompt of the studio, which was something like, "How do you know, or how do you know you're black, or when is your your black origin moment?" And, you know, I was reading a lot of like Derrida at that time, 
Uh, he was he was going to like archive fever and difference and the, the deferral. And I was like, yeah, that's right. You there's no origin, man. You can't never find it. You can just you can hold on to something, but sooner or later it's gone. But I I had I had to clap back on him because I saw this painting and one of my students saw this painting and put me on, right? And it seems to me that there are kind of shared experiences with power that I started to get engaged in. But I needed those experiences to engage painting in my way, through the tapestry. And then we have dilighting, uh, the management, the arrangement, uh, the lineup, the German. You must understand that beca because I'm really into like, uh, I'm not really, I'm, I kind of like, I kind of like Heidegger. He cool, man, even though he was not a good person. <laughs> The way, they, the way in which he and other philosophers, and my man Fred Moten, the way they work with language, I'm interested in. So I find ways to work with language. So that lighting is a kind of a nod to that working with language. And what I'm seeing in these works is the correlation between the suppression of peoples, right? We have the cops in the lineup here, married with the same kind of Goya here, right? The kind of social conscious that these paintings or these works create, right? But, it, but it's deeper than that, right? Because what happens in this image is it correlates itself to screen culture, right? Jacquard makes the tapestry. Uh, Charles Babbage finds the method uh, of, of making those tapestries years later. He creates the grandfather of the commuter, computer. Every time you stare at a, a TV screen, you're staring at a tapestry. If anyone knows anything about my background, I grew up in the 80s. TVs wobbled. They were very, they were never really stable. Uh, and images did the same thing, right? So the images moved and I'm trying to get that correlation out in the work, right? I'm also trying to get the relationship between uh, painting and weaving in the fact that it's stretched like a painting. It's also historic in its scale. So it's starting to approach history painting, right? That's where I'm trying to go. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do what Rembrandt didn't do. I'm trying to include particular black subjects. And again, at UTA, which when they installed it, I was like, don't do it that way. But with the tax, you know, I, I like the carry, I like the carry Jane, the, 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 the carry Jane's move. It, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty solid to me. Right. But, but still what it does life size, right. The scale of it and the bending and the bowing of the legs. I mean, is, isn't he a goat, a satyr? You know what that does to you when you're in front of this experience, it's phenomenological. You feel it psychologically, Physically, it's very kind of maybe haptic. And these are the, the ones where I was working them, but I wasn't working them hard enough to lose the image. So a lot of this stuff is when I start doing the picking. So if you can look at the image to the right, there's a little bit of fraying in the image. We about to turn that way up. While making this exhibition uh, or making works for the exhibition, Hands Up hands up spoke to me, right? Because whenever, whenever I walk, to the, walk through the Met or whenever I meet, I used to meet this particular friend of mine, lover to death, brilliant artist. Um, we, would, we would always meet in the African wing in front of the Dogon sculpture, which I did not include in the lecture because I didn't know if I was gonna, I didn't think I was gonna talk about this. Excuse me, water. Mm. And I used to, I used to, I used to ask her to meet me there because it was a, a specific spot for me that was just revelatory. Because I remember walking into that space, seeing the Dogon sculpture, the, 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 and it's the sculptures with our, their hands are raised to the into the air, in a kind of spiritual praise. One hand is one arm is blown off or gone. The other arm is is up. The figure is naked. It's all wood exposed genitals and buttocks. Now, when I go in there, it's a spiritual experience, but I'm gonna be honest. I've seen other uh, patrons gawk and stare. And I thought they don't even see the power in this. Well, let me, they don't even see the power in this. Well, let me, they don't even see the power in this. Well, let me see if I can help them see a power in it. Thinking about abstraction, thinking about fragmentation, thinking about the severance of limbs from bodies, both violent and sexual, uh, this, this, this emerges. So I find all these images in the history, 
right? Primarily, what are we talking? 19th century to today of black hands being raised. Now in three of them, the hands are specifically raised uh, without intervention. In the fourth one, bottom left, it's the same image, right? I'm gonna move a little bit from dilating, but picked up, flipped over and stretched in another piece. That kind of iteration, that kind of seriality, that is print, right? All of a sudden, I have taken, I, I wanna be able to say, we can take a weaving, stretch it as a painting, iterate it in different formats. And then all of a sudden we have weaving, painting, print. And because it comes from a photographic source, we have these four modes of image making smashed into one space. I'm trying to collapse the wavelength, man. I'm trying to collapse, collapse wavelengths while also uncollapsing them and making things expansive. That's what abstraction does, but let's go. So then we come back to one of my favorite artists, and now we're getting into it. Uh, Sam Gilliam, shout out to the grandfather, the homie, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. My great, my my grandmother used to used used to used to reprimand him on the streets, man. Susie Parker, what's going on? How you doing, Nana? R.I.P. What he did, because uh, I used to walking through the speed, they had a few of these, I remember, and they had the eight, the works from the 80s that are heavily constructed. What this work did for me when I realized he was black, because, you know, at first I was like, who, who's making these, what white man make these stained paintings? I'm going to be honest. And then I found out he was black. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm 16. My God, this man's a genius. <laughs> Never seen anything like it. And don't, don't play yourselves. We all do that. The drape and the staining. It did what I was trying, to, I'm gonna move fast, sorry. It did what I was trying to do here, but didn't realize it until I resurfaced and went to the Met, right? So I saw this, I saw these, I think this was the one at the Met I saw maybe for the first time when they, when they, re when they shifted the collection a few years ago. I, I didn't even put it together. I was like, I, I make, I'm doing Sam. Okay, I'm doing Sam. Well, what can we do with Sam? Well, what happens when Sam meets image? What happens when, again, abstraction meets representation? Well, shoot. A lot happens. Figures get folded up, faces mold, fingers bend and bow, they break, arms billow and enlarge. Faces of sadness get even more sadder. There we go, sadder. What happens when abstraction meets representation? Ooh. What happens, let's go here. What happens in the fold? What also happens in, in when abstraction meets representation is that you lose. I don't know if my cursor is being seen. I hope it is. But when you have creases and folds in the image, you lose that terrain. You lose that territory. You lose that knowledge. When you exclude, you lose a particular wealth of knowledge. And we have a lot. I'm gonna say that again. When you exclude, you lose a wealth of knowledge. Yes. Yes. Abstraction is promise. And how do we get there? I mean, there are a number of uh, creatives who, you know, introduced abstraction way before modernism. I mean, walking through the African Oceanic when you just like, bam, abstraction, bam, abstraction. Ooh, is that a Pollock? Yes. Ooh, is that a Rothko on a on a on an amazing uh, uh, boat that's, I don't know, twenty feet long? Yeah, that's a Rothko. And they did it before him. Man, we've been done that. We are the avant-garde, what you talking about. We are the avant-garde. But it doesn't mean, like I said, you don't fold all, all you don't fold the representation and then lose all of the good stuff. And 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 let's go there, right? So if we could use the metaphor of the folding of the tapestry, I let's just say we have this kind of like art historical tapestry that it's folded and now I'm unfolding it and finding all these amazing, amazing moments that I forgot, like Mark Toby and his white writing. Yes, we will call it white writing, right? So Mark Toby, 
I think a brilliant artist, goes to the goes to the East, studies uh, bah, I think it's Baha'i, Baha'i, um, studies calligraphy, also studies calligraphy uh, while in Oregon, I think, or Washington, I don't remember, sorry. Um, brings that back to his table and starts applying that to fields of, of very, very soft, subtle fields of color, right? The beginning of abstraction, the way we know it proper. So we're talking about, this is 59. This is, let me make that minimize. This is 35, right? He goes from this, there we go, to this. And in between that spectrum, it's all of these kind of white writing things, right? He's talking about how, how do you unify total space? Will you do it in abstraction? right? Representation tries to make defined edges for objects. We have a still life. We know what objects are, objects are in that still life. Abstraction or total all over pattern that unifies space. That's, you know, that's communal. That, that rubs against the individuation that the Western European ph philosophical uh, uh, tradition and political tradition tries to give us, right? That must be real now because Toby was doing, and even though this is 59, he did a bunch before 59, right? He did it before Pollock. Pollock's move is, I go big. I go big, I don't go home, right? Toby's move is, I, I go small, I don't need to go big until he does go big when he realizes he kind of needs to go big, but he don't go this big, right? Or if I could, if I could also shake that, that tapestry, that weaving out a little bit, I would find, we would find Frankenthaler, married with 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 Gilliam right and for me that 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 happened in the show that's up right now at the ice house JDJ my dear friend Jane ready for Saturday opening let's get it so I was able to do uh, an exhibition uh was my second exhibition at the space beautiful space garrison New York drive up hour drive Oh man, got to go through Jersey. Not a terrible trip through Jersey. You get to see the Hudson on the left of the car. Ooh, beautiful drive. And then you get to this mysterious property with this house that used to store ice. And you like, what the fuck is this? What, what is, what is, I, I drove up here for this. But then you realize it's bigger than that. It's fucking magic because you're not hearing the sounds of loud cars. You're not, you're not dealing with the rigmarole of just getting to the space, by which I mean commuters, subway, uh, oh, this train's delayed. Oh, the cab didn't want to pick me up because I live in a particular kind of part of town. You're not dealing with that. You're just dealing with nature and objects or experience. And in the exhibition, I took this, um, how would I say it? This is an inside view, sorry, beautiful. Uh, in the exhibition, I, I started with a prompt that was looking or recovering an interest in African, African American folklore or folk tales um, and, and myths and magic and folk beliefs. And there's this belief in this thing called the black cat bone that if you're standing in a particular part uh, of a fork in a road in the woods, and I'm paraphrasing, I hope I get it right. Um, if you have a mirror in one hand and you have the bones from a dead black cat, uh, you pass the bones through your mouth. And when you reach the one uh, while you're holding the mirror in your hand, and when you reach the one that makes you invisible, that's the black cat bone and you can pull it out and you can pull, you can use it. It's like a cloaking device, right? Well, that, that gets me to think about visibility and invisibility, what you can see, what you can't see, being seen, not being seen. So it also gets me to think about mirrors, right? Because the mirror is one of the objects within the whole seance um, or in the whole equation. So in the work, you're seeing things about reflection, mirrors, uh, getting, falling into, into a, a invisibility and coming out of emerging out of visibility. There we go, sorry, right? So let's just look at a couple of works so we can understand how abstraction is working for me through the works. Love that stove though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
excuse me, just need a little water. Whew. I'm trying to put a lot in today. Sorry. Whew, okay. So yeah, I have um, one of the images I have in the exhibition comes from uh, protest or unrest. I'll say unrest in Philadelphia in the 60s. Uh, I don't like to call them riots because I don't think when you're you're fighting for your own liberty. It's, 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 I don't think it's a riot in a sense, right? Uh, depending on how far you go, I guess. Um, yeah, I have to be honest. That's, that's, a, that's a truth I, I hold right now, I think. It'll probably change in another year. Um, but we have to be truthful with ourselves. Um, yeah, and I, I really enjoy this image, but I needed to fuss it up, right? Uh, and I was thinking about, uh, because I am going, uh, I do advocate all artists, particularly artists, go through therapy. You should be doing it. It makes the work better. It makes the work 10 times better. Um, plus, it, it also assuages any of the insecurities or some of the insecurities we all seem to have about, you know, being in the in, in, in public, right? Being being available for people all the time. Uh, shout out to Hito Sejero, uh, always being available, right? Um, but I needed to fuss the image up. So I got with my weavers and we worked on an image that was the same image, but inverted on itself, right? So they mirror each other, much like a Rorschach test, but doing a little wordplay, it becomes a horror shack test, right? And this is the first, um, this is the first tapestry I've ever publicly shown where I've taken the threads to this level. So let's go in and see what we're doing, right? So my assistant and I have these, um, I should have put the video in, but didn't think we'd have time. That's okay. Um, my assistants and I have these awls or nails, really. Uh, and we just pick, we stick, we stick our nails or our awls or any kind of sharp object into the thread and we pull the threads out, right? Because it's particularly necessary for people to understand first that the image itself is woven, right? That was one of my biggest uh, reasons for choosing this medium is that the image itself is woven and because it's woven, it's not printed. It's a whole nother animal because it's constructed in a whole nother way. Now, when you see the works online or you see them on screen, a lot of people are like, yeah, that's just printed, but it's not, you know, it's not printed, it's woven, right? And I thought to myself, well, let's really get that point across. One, that the image is woven. Two, that because like on the television screen, it can wobble, the image can wobble uh, circa 1980s. Uh, the image itself isn't stable. And if it's not stable, it, it can't really be real and hold meaning, right? Things that are not stable can't hold a particular kind of stable meaning. Like if you, if you, if you label a hammer a hammer, well, yeah, it's a hammer, right? But there's a moment in which it can, it can lose its stability and, not be, and become something totally different. And that's what I'm trying to get to with abstraction, right? If the thing itself can be destabilized or in a sense, right? What else can it be? If a hammer can break, what else can it do once it's broken? Ooh, I like that, right? That's, that's, that's that strange tool stuff. Okay, so we're picking all the threads and then we're also hanging laser cut basketball leather uh, onto the tapestries, which also spell out words in some cases. In this case, I think they were kind of cast off letters that I had laying around, uh, but nonetheless, it gets to there we go. It gets to this kind of conversation that I th also think that is critiquing or or challenging uh, Mark Toby's understanding of writing and painting, right? white writing, which I, I, I feel like there's an essay about that, which I haven't read yet, but I'm interested in that relationship between race and his understanding of language and his understanding of narrative and telling people things who gets to speak well he seems to get to speak until he got until he got overshadowed by the understudy mm, that's interesting pollock hello right so in the work for me i think with the threads being pulled out i'm alluding to that writing that he's doing but i don't call it that because i call it black writing right it's using the images that depict black subjects black pain black joy in a way that for me it feels like i'm trying to give a kind of narrative voice to these subjects through abstraction, ooh, right? And I'm trying to kind of like allude to that linguistic node, not just by the white writing of, um, oh, of Toby, but also by the use of the basketball material, right? So the basketball material itself reflects a black body, 
right? Because not only is it used by primarily uh, by the black body, but it also, when you see it up close, it has the kind of the kind of physicality, the bumps of a black body, right? That's that's on, that's a, that's another level of thinking, right? Or the question is, what happens in, in another whole kind of psychological space if you find these images, which I think are all this one's I think is from the L.A. Revolution, A.K.A. Riot, 90, 92. and you think, how do I isolate this and make something more out of it? Well, I find the palm tree, I warp the palm tree that let's go back that's above, right? That's above his head and find something else to focus on as opposed to the trauma, right? And that's my disassociation, right? And it also as a diptych sticks with the theme of mirroring, mirroring is the two at least, right? They also mirror themselves, but let's go deeper. I also include a mirror upon which a double-headed chick is uh, posed, right? That's that's my nod to a kind of Rauschenberg. He's, 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 he's a genius, right? But how do you take, and we'll finish with this and get to the last few. Oh, good, 38. We're going to 45. Okay, no, we're good. Um, have to be your cheerleader. How do you take this image, right? That everybody says to me, but no, you're always dealing with trauma and pain. I know because I'm trying to come to grips with my own death. That's real. I don't want to go. I like being here too much. I got too much to do, too many ideas. But the way it seems to be going now is they getting rid of us left and right. So um, I have to be prepared, I think. That's real. We have to be honest with ourselves. But how do we take that image and invert it, reverse its logic? How do we turn it upside down and abstract it? As soon as you do this, right? The reflections in the hood of that car, in, 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 in the officer's horse, right? Those reflections, what they do, right? To, the, to our understanding of representation for me are everything. Shout out to Nigel. So then I have it woven into something, right? If you can look, this is, this is the top of the car. This is the image flipped upside down. There's a hand here. There's, a, there's an arm and a shoulder. There's a holster, right? So what, sorry, what you're essentially looking at is the reflection of the, of the arrest or the assault in the hood of the car. This is what I might call my Trojan horse to, to their horse or something, right? And, and, and much in a kind of Tobian, Pollockian, Pollock way, we get, we win ham on it, right? Picking the threads until the, the image is, is almost, if not totally eviscerated, right? What happens when that, that image, when that representation falls into abstraction? So much more. Line becomes more engaging. Space becomes more engaging. Shadows, stains take on multiple colors. So much more happens. The possibility for hanging things, sorry, hanging things, like laser cut letters, or I, I, don't, I didn't have the slide or the image on me, but in here we've torn out a hole in the tapestry and then uh, attached a mirror, a magenta mirror to the back, right? So it's the same kind of magenta mirror, excuse my movements, as you see on the beneath the, or propping up the chick. We have that embedded in the image itself, in the actual hood of the car. So when you come into the show, you see yourself in the encounter. That's what abstraction can do. It can put you somewhere. So now let's circle back and finish up. Let's start where I really initially started, which is now the speed. And Allison Glenn, you know, and my man John introducing me to her and my work for including me in the promise show and thinking about how abstraction is promised. And I remember talking to her and I said, these ebony works, right? These ebony works that I'm working on, I'm gonna go back, right? Actually, let's go there. Let's go there, let's go there, right? So the ebony works particularly came out of my interest in uh, Rauschenberg. I love him. I was sad when he left. I wanted to meet him before he, he went home. I wanna meet Jasper Johns before he go, gets home. There, there are a number of them I wanna meet. When I met David Hammes, he blew my mind. And I met him a number of times, he's blowing my mind. I love meeting them when, they, when they're still here giving us energy. Um, but what he was able to do, right, Rauschenberg was able to do to take that drawing, put some effort into it, some grit. I mean, some real grit and, and finding pleasure in that. And in a kind of psychological way, killing the father or something. Creating a whole nother way of drawing. 
right? A lot of us in, in art school know the whole like drawing by subtraction, but I haven't found too many people, artists that I know now who really use it. And I thought it's a great, it's a great method because that's what black folks are. We, we, our, it just seems to me, and it's not just black folks, my, my LGBTQ folks, brothers and sisters in them days, I love y'all because that's who we are, right? There are ways in which we are erased. And when we are erased, the, the consequence of that erasure or that exclusion of some of our, our necessary characteristics and, 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 and believabilities in ourselves, create this, create a field on which technically you should, we should feel a little bad, violated that we're not being seen the way we wanna be seen. But I would advocate that maybe the ways in which we are being abstracted can be used tactically. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Abstraction doesn't have to be a negative in the sense that it's a reduction of, of subject. But there's a, there's a building of a whole nother subject and subjectivity that is I can project into these works that I can't always project, excuse my movement, in a work when I'm given everything. I can't I can't, I'm, I have a hard time growing up as a boy, reading these Ebony magazines, loving them, flocking to them and jet, seeing these images and not being, being, being hindered by them and the words that they give me. But, but when Rauschenberg queers, let's go there, when Rauschenberg queers uh, modernism, that's what he did. He allows us to queer other things. He allows us to break out of the structures that confine us and find other values and other possibilities. He allows us to strip it to the bone and become alien even to ourselves and find out things, shit, that in therapy you would say, I didn't even know I liked that, but you know what? I think I actually do like that. Abstraction is a, is a great place, I think. And sometimes I don't wanna fall fully into it because I'm totally afraid. I'm not gonna lie. That's like death, man. I don't know where I'm going after this. I'm totally afraid. But every now and then I like to fall into just a little bit of it and have a little bit of representation left so I can at least feel like I have a foot somewhere. Thank you. Do we have questions? I think I'm on time. Should I stop screen share? Noel, thank you so much. That was so fascinating. I love the energy that you bring to talking about your work. And I love um, hearing your unique perspective as you talk through these things, um, especially as an art historian. I, I, I enjoyed hearing your reactions to, to artists. Um, we do have one question um, ready to go. Um, in your work talking about the influence of David Hammonds at the beginning of the lecture, um, you were talking about um, his work to reject the gaze of the viewer. Can you talk a little bit about what that means, um, how you refer to it, um, to reject the gaze of the viewer and your work and also in his? Right, right, right. Okay. So think about it. Think about that show he had at l &M, that beast of a show when he did the, 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 tarp, the tarp paintings. Um, he had this, he had this, um, he had this work, this very much Duchampian uh, work with a kind of, it was a, it was a big tarp painting. It was a, it was a mid-sized tarp painting, I guess. And he had an armoire or a dresser pushed up against it, but the dresser was facing the painting, right? He had a slit in the back, right? And of course you're like, oh, just like Duchamp, you're going to look in the slit and you're going to see like this, this thing. And you look in the slit and you just see the empty, the empty uh, dresser, right? And you're like, of course. Why he doesn't, he, I leaned into this thing with trust, right? I leaned in thinking he was gonna give me access as if I, it, I, was, I was supposed to have some kind of privilege to that, right? I was entitled, that's what I meant. As if I was entitled to it. And he was like, no, you're not entitled to what you think you're entitled to, right? So there's a, I, 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 I align that with, with the kind of, if I can flip through the thing real quick, I align that with some of the earlier work there we go, sorry. Where it's the it's the details, right? It's like, yeah, you know, you could you could look at the whole tapestry and see an image image with in it, which is uh from a fat Albert coloring book of a boy on top of a horse, right? And you could search for that image all day, but I'm not gonna give it to you. 
because I put a car, I put a piece of carpet pad on top of it. I'm more interested in you getting into the work, which literally means leaning down, bending, doing some calisthenics, because the surprise of of moving your body in unsuspecting ways, you know, and in a, in a gallery really can open up different things for your uh, for your mind, you know. Uh, an example would be, um, I go to the Met, you know, every few Sundays, uh, every, every, I don't know, month, once a month. Uh, and a few, a few months ago, and I told the story before, but a few months ago, my partner and I, we were, uh, walking, uh, through the African wing and, you know, I was in there with someone I love. So, you know, I trusted everything about that space. And because I was able to lean into the totality of that space, I wasn't even looking at the objects because the objects weren't giving me the access that I needed. What gave me the access I needed were those shadows on that floor. Those shadows were everything and they were nothing, right? They were a flat thing on the floor, which gave me absolutely nothing at, in, in the sense of, I could draw this, it's gonna be this great thing. No, it didn't give me any of that but it took my mind somewhere, the abstraction of that three-dimensional object into two-dimensional space, which is a shadow. It took my mind to thinking, okay, well, what if we project shadows onto the ground, right? And then pick those things back up and then project them back into three-dimensional space and maybe four-dimensional space, which is Duchamp and in-dimensional geometry. All that happened because I wasn't looking for the kind of access, right? That I traditionally expect when I go into, you know, museums. Right? I can go into a museum, I can look in the corner and be mesmerized by a humidifier, right? Or I can stare at the, the guards and be like, I like the way that guard stands. How do, what can I do with that? I, I go to the Met half the time, I don't even look at the artwork. I study people, you know, I study objects. So yeah, I think, I think the first step is like recognizing that you as an artist can reject access for people. They don't get everything. You don't have to be present all the time and the work doesn't have to be present in a certain kind of way. You know, if you feel like making abstractions that, that, that you know, buck the role of representation and, and people are like, but I wish you, I could just see this thing a little bit better. Well, then they're not your audience. You know what I mean? You gotta know your audience, man. You know, you know, um, I was thinking about it the other day. I was like, I love my mother. Love her to death, my, my mother, I love her. But she asked me the other day, she said, well, you know, I, I'm happy you're writing. We like the writing, but can you write something that I can understand? And I, in my mind, I was like, I want to do that, but this ain't about you, <laughs> really. I love you. You, my, you, my, you, my, you are my mother. I love you to death. But it's not about you, right? This, this, these, this writing isn't for you. This writing is for someone else, and that's okay, you know? Thank you. Yeah, no. um, we have another question. Can you tell us about your experience being included in the Promised Witness Remembrance Exhibition? Oh, I cried. I never tell nobody that before. I cried. I mean, let's go, let's go there first, right? I used to get in this, um, um, I, I used to get in, in my Jeep Cherokee, 1986 bronze Jeep Cherokee, rusted as shit. I love that car. I was happy my father bought it for me. I cried when he bought that for me. But he broke the bank trying to buy that and we didn't have no money for it. But I asked for it, he bought it. it had a hole in the back, uh, in the uh, passenger back, back right side. You could smell the gasoline fumes <laughs> coming through the hole in the floor. Um, I had one good speaker. Uh, it was on the passenger left side. Whenever I had friends, I'd be like, yo, move your leg for we can hear that, hear the music, right? That thing drove, that was my chariot to the Speed Museum. I had a hoopty and I loved it. It was everything for me. That chariot, that, that mule got me down there when I was 16. That mule invested in me and I invested in it because my parents invested in me and invested in it. That mule was everything. And when I got to the Speed, it opened me up, right? And for Alice and Glenn to come back and say, hey, we really want you to include the work. You know, so people get to know more about you and who you are, because you know you are you you in shadow right now. It was it was everything. It was the mule. It really was. Um, to be able to hang with my idols, Sam, Lorna, be able to hang with her again and and, and Hank, the, the the brilliant Hank and, and Nick and everybody to hang with them again and be able to to be honest, 
And this is real because, you know, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, and I hate to say this, but, you know, growing up a black kid from Louisville, Kentucky, I wasn't supposed to be here. Be, to be ahead of a program at NYU, to be thinking on this level, I wasn't supposed to be here. You know, the art world wasn't particularly made for a person like me. Academia may not have been made for a person like me. So to be able to be included in that exhibition, I don't know, I don't know if Allison understands what she did and John did and what that group did and what the speed did. They reaffirmed a little bit of value that I had lost. Right? Those ebony works, I made, I started making those in 08 or, or, or 09. Nobody gave it, nobody gave them a look. Um, I had them in, I used to show them with my old dealer, guy, guy rest his soul, Jack, man, You're up there with Monk, Monk playing that piano. I love you to death, Jack. Um, he, he and a few other collectors like AC, AC Hudgens and a few other were the only people who were on the, on the wavelength to understand what I was trying to do. Um, and when Allison said, these are good, what we, what we doing with these, you know? And not to say that other museums didn't put them in, because they did, but there was a particular conversation we had that I wanted to get to. Uh, I forgot to put the slide in. Allison, when we had our studio visit by way of, I think it was phone, that I thought was going to be 20 minutes, ended up being an hour. She reframed my understanding of those works. Or I thought of erasure as a violent act. She was like, no, there's a lot in there. Think about his promise. You know, I was like, oh shit, there's that. She allowed me to, you know, she, she said, yeah, you looking at it this way, let's move over here. So not only did she reframe, help me reframe the work so that I can continue to reinvest in that project because now I'm making them again. I had stopped making them for a while. Um, by putting me in the show, she also reframed my vision of myself. Does that make sense? That's incredibly powerful. Thank you Yeah, no, no, no. for sharing that with us. That's, that's incredibly moving. We have another question. As we navigate the pandemic and racial reckoning, what implications do you see for artists based on your lived experiences? Oh, I don't understand that question. Uh, say that again. That's like an SAT. Let's go. Say it again. Say it again. As we navigate the pandemic and racial reckoning, what implications do you see for artists based on your lived experiences? Oh, well, let's go there. Um, well, I, I, I think it's good. It, honestly, it opens up, um, it opens up acceptance about this black, black subjects being represented in art. Right. And, you know, from, from the extremely representational work of, of, of the brilliant Jordan Castile, right. To uh, to the abstraction of, of my man Kevin Beasley doing the damn thing, uh, 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 Simone's doing it right. It, it's opening up pathways or, or 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 lanes, right, for for the for the talent to to shine, right. Um, it's it's also you know it's 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 kind of flooding the market with a lot of figuration sometimes. Uh, but the figuration is good. So what do you want me to tell you? But it's also making something that I think David Hammond said. Uh, it's 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 critiquing him in a, in a great way, where it's like you know that I, I mean I, Jack told me this shit once where he was like you know he and Hammonds were having this conversation or something like there'd never be a, a an abstract a, a a successful black abstract painter in it, and in that age when those things were said that's true, but there's a way in which they did the legwork for for a lot of us, and we're we're luckily benefiting. And and in a way, you know, I, I feel guilty for the benefit, you know, because they struggle, man. They struggle, you know. Um, so there 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 are some things that are happening, right? Um, and it's also making it more possible uh, to tell your truth, to tell your truth. Right. Or as, as little black children say, when I when I'm growing up, what's your true truth? We'll tell your true truth. Right. That's what that's what's happening now. And I think it's I think it's awesome. Um, I think it's awesome. I think it's really awesome. The, the, the amount of mixing and copying and remixing of things that are happening in the world, man. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy they brought me back for this this particular time. I don't know. If I if I lived when I I used to tell my father man if I lived when I was a slave I I, I would have been a terrible slave pick what mm, no out oh that whip yeah I guess we're doing work today, 
Um, but to be able to live in this moment, it's scary, but damn, it's, it's interesting. It's really interesting. I mean, the amount of stories that we're going to have when we go to the other side, we can tell people what we did while we were here. Shoot. You know, it's, it, reframe the world in that way. I'm just trying to collect a bunch of experiences. So when I die, I got great stories to tell people. You know, I'm going to tell my father some stories. He's going to be like, shit, tell me another one. You know, Noel, listening to you talk about your artwork, um, I'm so fascinated by the process um, that you apply both to tapestries, but also your ebony works. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could um, tell us a little bit about um, uh, the ebony erasure works and the technique and the process, because those have such a beautiful finish Mm -hmm. um you know i i wonder how much originally you you know the material of the printed paper that ebony is printed on you know how much that contributes to it and um any other manipulations that you apply to get to get those really fabulous surfaces in the final works sure sure um yeah so i initially started out much like rauschenberg i had i, I was buying a bunch of erasers and i remember i was traveling through europe at the time and found this one <clears throat> stadler eraser that i could never find here that actually had pumice and grit built into the eraser. My God, that thing was great. I could erase ebony magazines like crazy, but it was still taking too long. Uh, plus with the friction of the eraser, you would, I would tear pages. You know, and once it's torn, it's not always that great. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's, you've lost a really good thing. So I had to figure out how to do that. Um, and to be honest, it was a trial and error of mixing uh, chemicals which I do not advise, uh, <laughs> but uh, now that I know which ones to use, I'm very safe about it. Uh, and what the chemicals allow me to do, if you look at the check the skin one, which I think I'm sharing, um, uh, it's very painterly. Yeah, exactly. Right? So I, and, and that's, what, that's what the chemicals allowed me to do. It allowed me to take the ink, move it in a painterly fashion. You know, I can loosen it up and then wipe away what I don't need and keep what I need. Right. So the way in which I work is in a very painterly fashion. And right, because these were done in 2009. Right. At, even at that moment, while I was in grad school, I was and I didn't realize it because I didn't have the terms to understand what I was really dealing with. Um, and I'm not sure I really still do. Um, I was still I was really interested at that time about what happens when black representation falls into some kind of abstract space only to realize because we're not seen as full people we're already always already living in that abstract space and that goes for everybody who's marginalized it ain't just black folks you know everybody in a sense is this kind of like cocoon alien everybody is kind of walking around in this kind of space in which we're not fully seen and as such we're at the edge of visibility right that's a question we should ask ourselves while we leave you know what does it mean to be at visibility's edge what kind of intimacy do you lose when you, you're not close to the thing? What kind of knowledge do you lose when you're not close to the thing? What kind of love and feeling do you lose when you're not close to a person? Hmm. That's abstraction. Yeah, we'll end with that. You know, Nina Simone says, you know, I'm trying to trying to make the world better. She say, she said, uh, you asked me, how do I explain my music? And she's like, how do, how do I explain my music? I mean, how do you explain love, you know? How do you explain love? You can, I can show you, I can write these songs, I can show you a photograph, but I can't explain love, man. It's just a thing you gotta do, right? Representation explains too much. Abstraction, don't, don't try to explain too much. It just does what it needs to do. We have yeah. a comment on, on what you were just talking about. Um, someone made the observation Mixing chemicals for the abrasure prints are symbolic to me of how Black Americans use chemicals to change, erase their skin color. I thought of this when I viewed your work at the Speed Exhibition. That, right, and they're all cosmetic ads too. That's in there. Bleaching the skin, that's all in there. What, what kind of damage do we do to ourselves to try to reach these kind of standards that we don't even make for ourselves? Like, what is this? What are we talking about? You know? So yeah, all that's in there. I mean, really... I, I, to be honest, these are some of the, these are my favorite works. That's why I can never get rid of them. They're my favorite. Because, you know, and our, every now and then, if you're, if you're lucky, you know, a comedian tells a joke that's just like, that's the greatest fucking great joke. A musician has that, that one thing. It's like, damn, that's that that's great song. Not maybe a one hit wonder. 
But as an artist, you have a move and you like, I don't know why, but I like that move. You should you should keep it around so you, it inspires you. You know, I just happen to be inspired by a lot of the moves I'm making. <laughs> well, no, I think you've inspired all of us tonight. And um, I really appreciate your taking the time to talk with us, um, to share with us information about your work. And um, we all look forward to seeing more of your work in the future. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you all. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, I want to remind you that uh, currently on exhibition is Isabel de Bourgeois Fashioning Art from Paper, which is on view through August the 22nd. And hope you enjoy that um, exhibition as well. Can you say one more thing? Sorry. Uh, can I say one more thing? Yes, of course. Yeah, I'm, uh, you, you could go to my website, nwastudios.com and look at the work. I'm currently updating it. It's gonna take a while uh, because I'm writing two essays right now. I think I'm writing one about what does it mean for the black teacher to return to the university uh, after George Floyd, that's gonna be baller. And then I'm writing another one about blackness and simulation for a, a publication in London. But I'll put that all on IG and you know, follow me on IG, uh, NW Anderson Art, okay? Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you all so very much for joining us tonight. And thank you, Noel. This has been incredible. Thank you.